In your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 1. We just had a little informational overview about Ephesus, about this book, a little bit about the writer Paul, and we're going to talk about it again tonight. And if you want a title for the first three verses, verses 1, 2, and 3, we, we cannot, should not go past that if you ask me. And if you want a title for it, I'll title it Riches. I guess if I were upstairs teaching the teenagers, the title would be, I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm rich. Uh, people say I should teach the adults the way I teach them, but I don't know. When I first came to the church, I taught the kids the way I taught adults, and that didn't go over well. I had to learn how to, how to teach teenagers. But anyway, riches, uh, the first thing we're going to look at tonight uh, would, will be the riches of the writer. The Holy Spirit's the author and the Apostle Paul's the writer. And actually someone wrote for Paul because of his eye problem. But as he was led of the Holy Spirit, it was recorded. And so we're going to see a privilege of Paul right here in the beginning of the first verse. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. What a privilege. There is no greater privilege than to serve the Lord Jesus Christ with our life. Amen. Look, out of any important thing that might go on in the world, I, I believe that there's nothing more important than serving the Lord. And so Paul had a great privilege. Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ. Paul's name means little. He was a little man. He might have been an inch or two over five foot or somewhere around there. He was a very small man, but he had a very big privilege of serving the Lord, of taking the gospel out into this world. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. I'll, I'll just think of two things right now that that give reason why Paul would title himself that in such a way. First of all, because it's true. By the will of God, he was an apostle of Jesus Christ. And secondly, there were a lot of Judaizers. There were a lot of liars out there that said because he came along later as an apostle, he was an apostle of men. He had hand-me-down, uh, second-rate information because it came from man. Well, God sent Paul off uh, away from the other apostles for some three years, and it was God and Paul, and, and God leading Paul to teach and to minister the word. So he precisely said that he is an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. It even says in another letter, not, not by the will of man, but by the will of God. And that's because of the accusations that came against him. And God gave him liberty to defend that for God's glory. An apostle is one sent forth by God on a, on a mission to serve the Lord. And Paul had such a, a precious privilege of proclaiming that gospel. And you know, that's a privilege that you and I all have. You don't have to be a preacher to, to share the good news of Jesus Christ. You don't have to be a man to share the good news of Jesus Christ. A Christian can share the good news of the glorious gospel for the saving of a soul. If the Lord Jesus has saved your soul, you know how to tell someone else how to be saved. And so there's a privilege that ties in for all of us in this. But after seeing the privilege of Paul, we go on and we see the people, those he's writing to, to the saints, which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Now we talked a little bit about saints last week. Saints speaks of a Christian's position. We don't progress into being a saint 
after we're saved by some amount of works or some amount of righteousness, we are permanently fixed in a position as a saint when we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. We have been set apart by God. I love one definition that I that I looked up. We are exclusively His. The moment we're saved, we are set apart by Him. And so this speaks of a permanent position that the Christian immediately has when they are saved. But there's something else that speaks of those he's writing to. And we touched on it in the uh, overview last week. But he's writing to the saints which are at Ephesus. So we go from the position of the people to the place of the people. And there was no greater city for a commercial buy, sell, and trade and, and, and wealth than, than this city of Ephesus along the coast of Asia Minor at this time. It was a very thriving city. It was also a very wicked city, though. There were a lot of the godless there that and they they hated the things of God and despised the things of God. Yet, yet God started a church right there in that place. I, I tell you, God is going to do a lot of things that we don't see coming or that we wouldn't plan to do. You know, Paul had a desire to go and to witness there. But God always knew what he was going to do and where he was going to do it. That serves as far as planning the church of Ephesus. And that serves in our lives every day as well. Well, we not only see the place of the people at Ephesus, but the placing, I'll call this, of the, pe of the people, the faithful. The faithful in, in Christ. God used someone to go to Ephesus to minister the gospel and the hearers were so persuaded above the wickedness of Ephesus, above the idol worship of Ephesus. They were so persuaded by what they heard that they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. They placed their trust in him. They were they were the faithful as in they they trusted and and some talk about faithful as in being trustworthy uh, and and they both go together in a lot of ways. But they placed their faith in the Lord Jesus, uh, the Messiah, for sure. You know, the most sinful place cannot stop God's will for whatever he has planned there. And God saved souls here in this wicked place. Well, we see the privilege of Paul, a couple of things about the people and in verse 2, we're going to look at the prayer of Paul. I was tempted to, to pass it up for a second, and I'll tell you why later. But we're definitely going to look at this prayer of Paul, and we're going to be here for longer than I expected. But verse 2 says, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. As we learned last week, Paul is in prison and he's writing to this church and his desire for them is grace and peace in their lives. You know, we are grace. We are saved by grace and it's grace that also sustains us after we're saved we need grace to be saved. We need grace as we live our saved life. Paul's desire was that the undeserving, unearned favor of God would be so apparent and uplifting in their lives and bless them. That they would be overwhelmed with the goodness of God and the kindness of God in their life. That's Paul's prayer for another group of Christians. While he's not with them, nothing to get credit for. He's just, that's simply the heart of Paul as he thinks about the other people of God. That they would be filled with the experience of grace and also of peace. 
most of Ephesus was populated with the enemies of God, those who are hostile against God and toward one another and toward God's people. A lot of that going on there. But when those of Ephesus were justified by faith, the Bible says that they had peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Peace is something instantly that happens in a moment when one trusts Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And here again, just like grace, peace is something that we need every moment in our lives. And praise God, we have access to it. We have access to the peace of God. And maybe there's a Christian that's just overwhelmed wishing that upon your life tonight. Making requests to God in your behalf. That's what Paul was doing for them. See, we're justified by faith and we have peace with God. And that happens in a moment. But what we need, what we need every moment is the peace of God. Philippians says, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your, heart, your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And that is something that we need always. Peace is that conversion and peace is continual for our lives. It's something that we can have the experience of. Peace is the tranquil state that we come into of being assured of our salvation and content with our lot in life. See, assured of salvation, that's peace with God. Content with our lot in life, that is the peace of God. My favorite hymn by Horatio Spafford is, uh, It is well with my soul. He writes in there, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. And I guess my favorite part of my favorite hymn is just the very beginning. When peace like a river attendeth my way. This is what Paul desired. It was his heart's desire by a clean heart created in him by God and as a new creation, as a man in the will of God, though, though imprisoned, his heart's desire was this grace and this peace. These two monster blessings to just be so apparent and so daily experienced in the lives of those of this church. Grace and peace to you. Paul said that to Rome. In the opening salutation. He said it twice to Corinth. First and second. The churches of Galatia. Grace and peace to you. Philippians. Grace and peace to you. Colossians. Both. Both letters to Thessalonica. Both to Timothy. And one to Titus. You think. You think he just sat there. And whoever wrote for him. Most of the time. You think he said, just just open up with the general salutation. No, that that's not the word of God. Every word of God is very precise and it's full of power and it's full of meaning. And it and it has the same meaning to every church. But there were different experiences that they all were going through. The, the care of all the churches came upon da Paul daily. And so he was thinking about everything they need. And everything they need daily would be would be wound up and bound up in grace and peace. There was never a thoughtlessness in this, though, though it was written to all of the churches that Paul wrote to. It was never just a whole hum standard greeting. There's not a, a word or a phrase in the Bible that's without fullness of power and being precisely given from God. And these pair of riches are what we need for the greatest experience we can have every day. We need it 
every day. We need grace every day and we need peace every day. Every day has its conflicts with something with someone. Every day there is temptation to sin. Every day there's temptation to doubt. To be discouraged. We never know what we're going to face every morning when we wake up. But what we can know that we have access to is something greater than we're going to face every day. And that is God's daily grace for you and his peace for you in your life. All the temptations and everything we deal with, becoming depressed, focusing on our problems or falling into sin. Thank God we have access to God's grace and his peace. It's good for us. God gives it to us and it's good for us and we need it. And we can we can maybe right now think about, yes, how we do need it. And, and praise God tomorrow morning when I wake up, there is grace for me and there is peace for me. Paul would have been all right thinking that he was in the he was in prison for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and he needed grace and peace. But you see what he's doing here? He has a heart for others. This is his request, not only maybe for himself, but Paul is praying this for others. For he made it clear for every church that was his desire, that was his wish for them. I've heard a lot of Christians talk about how they, they'd like to be like Paul. Oh man, if I were just half the Christian... That Paul was. I would be doing so good. And we may not preach like Paul. And we may not plant churches like Paul. But what a good prayer would be. Lord give me the heart. Of Paul. That came from you. That I would wish this grace and peace. Upon the lives of others. How sweet would it be. Here at Lakeway. If going home. It, you can't just picture where everybody sits from up here. All of you know where everybody sits too. And just to, just to picture all of your brothers and sisters in Christ while you're in prayer. And your heartfelt, sincere desire that God gives you and me to pray for this in the lives of others. That this unearned favor would just be so overwhelming. That, that their cup would run over. That they would... Really experience that peace that passeth all understanding. We might not preach like Paul, but, but we can plead like Paul for other people, for the people of God. And it, it's going to start right here with the next thing we go to, to be able to do that. And that is the praise. There's a lot of blessing in this verse. And there's a lot of skipping over of the very first one, but we dare not do so. Verse 3, we see the praise. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's a lot of blessings from God to us that we're about to look at. But how about the blessings to God? That, that's how it starts. Right here. That's what Paul does. Blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the first thing we see here. Paul's praise is to be applied to God right here. That word bless means to speak well of. And we should speak well of God. We should speak well to God of God. We, we should speak well to others of God. I used to work with a guy and and he came hunting me up on Monday morning. I could tell he was a man on a mission and I thought he might have had a, some kind of preacher joke or or off Christian joke to tell me he had heard. But in but to my surprise, just by experience we had, he came up to me and couldn't wait to tell me, Kenneth, I went to church yesterday. He said, and I liked it. And we, <laughs> And when I walked out, I found myself roped into these group of men and they were talking about God. 
He, and, and the fellow told, he said, you know what? There's nothing wrong at all with talking about God. They were talking about how good he was. And it felt good to me that they were talking good about God. That's what we should do. That's what God deserves for us to do. That's going to help you and I the more we talk about him. There's no greater person to talk about. So we should give praise to God just as just as Paul did here. We need to bring before the Lord, if you will, a free will offering of, of a kind today. A free will offering in the Old Testament was an offering simply offered to God for his acceptation. It wasn't for sin. It wasn't for anything else. It was simply because you loved God that you would offer a free will offering to God. I love you and I just present this to you as a gift, God. You've gifted me. Let me gift you just for his acceptation. And we should have our verbal outward praise and free will offerings from the heart offered up to God. Now we can, now let's get into the prospering. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. First, we see his blessings to us. It, it couldn't be more simple. He hath blessed us. God has blessed us. You're here tonight and you know that you're blessed. You know, I, I didn't, I used to not say that a lot. That wasn't my reply because I thought someone, you know, I'm a baby Christian. I thought somebody might think, well, that's just, that's just a cookie cut young man. He, he heard somebody else say that, so he's saying that. But every time I used to run into this preacher who's in glory now. And I asked him, how you doing? How you doing, Brother Swillen? He said, blessed. I am blessed. And man, I, I thought that that's not Christian jargon right there. That man is blessed by God and thankful for the blessings of God. We are all blessed. We are so rich. We are so rich in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have had so much favor bestowed upon us by God that only heaven will be able to tell. Count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. We're going to be surprised when we get to heaven of the blessings we didn't even know about, of the blessings we just couldn't fathom, that we just couldn't get to in our, in our counting, all that God has done for us. That's actually what you and I are going to be sharing through verse 14. And it might take a month to get through them, or, or two weeks, I don't know. But we're going to look at all the ways that we are blessed in all all of these verses and it is going to take a while and our blessings go beyond that. Every need met in our life comes from the hand of God. Everything good in our life. Look, we should speak well of his name for anything good because every good and perfect gift cometh from above. And it comes from God. And the hand of God has given us every good thing that we have. Everything we would call bad that comes along. God can make it good. God can turn burdens into blessings. He blesses us in so many ways we don't realize. Some of the greatest blessings we're, we're, we're so fretful over because they start as a burden. And they end up amazingly glorifying God and God doing something in our life he couldn't have done any other way. Someone said we we couldn't know the, the mountaintop of joy without the valley of sorrow or something like that. And, and that is true in so many ways. The prospering that personally takes place in our lives. He hath blessed us. And why has God blessed us? God has blessed us because he loves us. He has blessed us because we're his children. And he has blessed us for his glory. 
He just a there's you a factual statement just to consider right there in that phrase. Who hath blessed us? God hath blessed us. How? By way of the Holy Spirit. God hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings. There's too many people talking about God blessing you with a Cadillac if you will give to their ministry, if you will do this or if you will do that. First of all, God's blessings are free. They're found on the path of His will. But His blessings are free. And second of all, the saved and the unsaved drive Cadillacs. All right? Not saying the Cadillac's not a blessing, but the saved and the unsaved drive that. God lets it rain, and God lets us, the sun shine on the just and the unjust. Everybody's blessed, but not with these spiritual blessings. Blessings given in the inner man. I tell you what, you can't top those spiritual blessings. You know, a piece of property is a blessing, but not like the blessing of being filled with purpose within. I specifically remember that one. I specifically remember my emptiness when I was lost. And I, I never had a thought to harm myself ever, but I, I did have a thought that what am I even doing here? What, what, what's the reason for me being here? To be filled with purpose. You know, money is good, but it can't buy a peace of mind. Peace of mind is one of those inner blessings. A spiritual blessing that's given by God to his people. You know, a lake house is cool. But how about the ability to overcome loneliness? Even when no one's there. Because of the Lord in your life. Those those inner blessings, man, you, you can't top them. You can't match them. And they're only for God's people. And we're going to go through so many greater ones through verse 14. Be here next week and bring somebody next week and the next week. Because we're going to talk about how rich we are in the spiritual blessings from God. They're given to us. By the Holy Spirit. And they're from heaven. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings. In heavenly places. In Christ. We don't have to get to heaven. To experience heaven's blessings. I mean we're getting to heaven. We're going to heaven one day. But we don't have to wait till we get there to experience heaven's blessings. The spiritual blessings that we have came from heaven. And they're given to you and I here while we're on this earth. The next book, the book of Philippians, says that our conversation is in heaven. And that word conversation means citizenship. We have dual citizenship right now. And the most important one is in heaven already for the child of God. The old country preacher said that that the down payment on heaven is the Holy Spirit in our hearts. And we have the blessings of heaven now. We get them here. Notice what he said. Who hath blessed us. That word hath is past tense. We already have the spiritual blessings of God in heavenly places in Christ. We already have those. All the blessings of heaven have already been given. And all that Jesus has given us from heaven makes us far richer than, than anything, than any jingle can give upon this earth. We, we think about the blessings we can see. We, we, we tend to 
to aim low and think low of material blessings that we sometimes get, sometimes don't, when we always have the greatest blessings within, within the child of God, in Christ, all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. May I not dare skip those two words after such a wonderful series of of in Christ or with Christ or or whatever they were. It's in Christ that we have these blessings. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And people say, I did that. Oh, I did. that. I believe in him. Well, what does that mean to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? It means to be in Christ. You believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you in Christ? Colossians says Christ in you is the hope of glory. It's a personal, spiritual, intimate relationship that we come into where we're made a new creature in Christ And we know all of our sins are forgiven. It's an inward thing that happens. And we have peace that all of our sins are forgiven. And we know we're a new creature in Christ. And we know he has cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. And we know that his blood was great enough to wash away all of our sins. And we are a child of God. We know we're citizens of heaven. One preacher said, I couldn't go to hell if I wanted to. And I say, amen. All of these are in Christ. Man, these spiritual blessings. You know what this got me to thinking? And I and I wouldn't I wouldn't say it probably without precise influence of the word of God at the time, even though I should, because it's true. And that is, we can make it without the exterior blessings. We can. That's why the Lord only promised food and raiment. That, those are the only two he promised, physical blessings. We can make it without them. Think about this life and living this life. We could make it without those. But we couldn't make it without those inner Inner blessings. That's what we couldn't make it without. Those are the most important ones. That, those are the necessity. That's what we need. And that's what we have. And that's what we have access to. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us praise Him for all these things. And let Him give us such a heart. That that's what we want for one another. I reckon... If that was our prayer and that was our focus, that was our meditation for the children of God of this church, that they would be that their cup would run over with grace and peace. I don't know how we wouldn't want to smile and and hug their neck. If that's what we thought about them all week, it would it would show. And we just have a good old hallelujah. I'm not going to say how I was going to sum that event up. But you, you, you know what I'm saying. We're rich. I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm rich. That's what I tell the teenagers. But let, let us just go home tonight and let us just consider the riches of God in our life. It'll make you feel a little better. Don't do it to feel a little better. Do it to glorify God. But that's what's going to happen in response. It'll surprise you what the Lord has done. Well, amen. All right. Uh, Brother Nolan, would you close us in a word of prayer tonight? It's almost time for Awana to be out, and you can uh, grab your children at that time. Thank you for being here, and I hope to see you next week.